I recently finished reading Managing Multiple Sclerosis Naturally, A Self-Help Guide to Living with MS by Judy Graham, one of the early proponents of lifestyle, diet, and alternative treatments in multiple sclerosis. Today in this video, I'll review the key points. Let's have some fun. I'm Brandon Beaver, and I make videos about MS every Wednesday, so please click subscribe and ring the bell for notifications. Now, I was inspired to read the book after I actually had Judy Graham herself respond to one of my threads on Twitter. Now, I have no way of verifying that this was the real Judy Graham, but I highly doubt anyone has impersonated her, and I did incorporate some of her comments into this presentation, so take it for what it's worth. Now, a little background on Graham. She has had MS for a very long time. Retrospectively, she notes that her symptoms started at around age 19 in 1967, but she was not formally diagnosed until 1974 when she was about 26 and is now around 73 years old. So she's had MS for over 50 years. Some of her early symptoms described as relapsing MS were limb numbness, abdominal tightening or banding, and layer meets sign, which is sensory symptoms in response to flexing the neck, also some weakness and walking difficulty. But she did relatively well, and she had a full career as a TV, TV producer, a radio broadcaster, and a journalist. She has a son named Pascal, and she's now widowed. And during her career, she did things such as editing a magazine called New Pathways in the United Kingdom, which is about MS and alternative treatments. And she herself was treated by the nutritional doctor, Dr. Georges Mouton, and she never took any disease-modifying therapy, although it obviously was not available when she was first diagnosed, though she did take some medications such as ibuprofen for pain and estrogen replacement therapy. The original edition of this book was Managing Multiple Sclerosis Naturally, published in the 1980s, and it actually inspired several of the other lifestyle books about MS. Now, she does note that she's done quite well over the years, but she has had some worsening symptoms, and she did develop progressive MS. So in 2010, when this book was published, she noted that she had to use a scooter to walk long distances. And in 2019 on Twitter, she noted she had some other symptoms of MS, like incontinence and pain, but still said she was doing relatively well and enjoying her retirement. She's not planning on writing any more books or doing any major contributions to the field at this point, just sort of enjoying life. So what are the general principles of the book? Well, in terms of diet, she primarily keeps the best bet diet advocated by Ashton Embry, who is actually the writer of the foreword of this book. And I'll post a video above where I review the documentary called In Living Proof by Matt Embry, who is Ashton Embry's son, who keeps the same diet and has done very well and advocates this diet and promotes it in his charity. But anyways, the key principles are avoiding foods that are potentially pro-inflammatory, and I'll talk about those. She favors alkal alkalinizing foods, there's some evidence that the modern Western diet has a very high ratio of omega-6 fatty acids to omega-3 fatty acids, mostly due to refined vegetable oils. And this may trigger a more pro-inflammatory state, very different than the ancestral diet, which was reportedly much higher in omega-3 fatty acids. So she recommends increasing omega-3 fatty acid to omega-6 fatty acid ratio. She advocates for a diet rich in micronutrients, and testing for individual food sensitivities. So she acknowledges that everyone is different and may need a slightly different diet. She talks about avoiding potential environmental toxins, regular exercise, stress management, and she talks about having a good attitude and positive thinking towards the end of the book. She's very open about the different ideas she's willing to consider, and she talks about various forms of evidence, epidemiologic evidence, randomized trials for various different treatments, and even anecdotal reports, and anecdotal reports of different alternative treatments appear throughout her book. She's not really critical of any specific possible alternative therapy, nor is she particularly critical of standard or Western or pharmaceutical treatment. She just sort of provides information mostly focused on alternative treatments and diet. Now, if you want more information on the Best Bet Diet, or now known as the MS Hope Diet, you can go to the website www directms.org, now run by Matt Embry, again, the son of Ashton Embry. 
But the key principles are avoiding gluten. There's some evidence that some people have an inflammatory response to gluten, which can lead to growth of the fungus candida in the gastrointestinal tract, leading to a leakiness of the gut and hyperpermeability of the gut. And she advises avoiding gluten regardless of the results of allergy testing. She also recommends avoiding dairy legumes, which are also potential allergens, along with refined sugar and foods to which you are sensitive. And we'll talk about that on the next slide. Based on the original research by Roy Swank, suggesting an epidemiologic association between saturated fat consumption and the risk of MS, she recommends a low saturated fat and low trans fat diet. And she also recommends reducing, though not eliminating, non-gluten grains. Beer should be avoided because it generally contains gluten, though wine is acceptable in moderation. So what can you actually eat? Well, you can have fish, fruits, vegetables, chicky, chicken, turkey, and game meats. Sugar alternatives such as honey, maple syrup, and stevia are okay. Though Graham herself avoids eggs, bananas, chocolate, and kiwi, but this is based on her individual food sensitivity testing. So she wouldn't necessarily make this recommendation to all people. Now, how do you know what you're sensitive to? There are various ways to find this out. One is to do a total elimination diet. This is where you keep a very strict and limited diet, avoiding any potential food allergen. And then you slowly add things back in one by one and you see if you develop symptoms in response to the potential allergen. If you feel well, then you assume that you're not allergic to that food. But if you develop a symptom, you assume you could be allergic to that food and consider avoiding it on a long-term basis. There's also blood testing and intradermal testing although she acknowledges that these are imperfect methodologies. And she also talks about some alternative methods. One is Vega testing, which is a homeopathic method where they put a potentially offending substance in a cylinder and hook it up to a machine that creates an electrical circuit and it gives a reading, letting you know if you could be allergic to it. There's also applied kinesiology, where you hold an offending substance or potentially offending substance in a glass and a practitioner sort of pushes down on your right arm. If your arm gives way, it implies that the substance has weakened you and you could be allergic to it. There are various other methods that she describes as well. She talks about a lot of different supplements, vitamins, and minerals. These are the key or essential supplements. Vitamin D3, it's known that low vitamin D is linked to risk of multiple sclerosis and prognosis of multiple sclerosis. Fish oil, which contains omega-3 fatty acids. And she also recommends calcium and magnesium. But she takes a lot of other vitamins, including vitamin A, B complex, and specific B vitamins such as B3 and B12, along with folate, vitamin C. And uh, just to note that the vitamin D3 level recommended by Ashton Embry of 25 hydroxy or active vitamin D is 125 to 200 nanomoles per liter. Or if you're in the United States, it would be 50 to 80 nanograms per milliliter. And this is very similar to what doctors would recommend or what George Jelinek recommended in overcoming multiple sclerosis. What about other supplements? She also takes grape seed extract, ginkgo biloba, evening primrose oil, resveratrol, 5-HTP, alpha lipoic acid, which has been used for neuropathic pain in neurological diseases, flax seed oil, which is an omega-3 fatty acid supplement and alternative to fish oil, coenzyme Q10, and many other supplements. And in terms of minerals, she recommends zinc, copper, selenium, manganese, and iodine. Now she talks about some other treatments. So what she herself does is she does Pilates for exercise. She has tried hyperbaric oxygen treatments, acupuncture, reflexology, osteopathy, homeopathy, and she does weekly shiatsu massage. And for exercise, she recommends Pilates, as I said, yoga, weight training, and functional neuromuscular electrical stimulation, where you directly stimulate muscles to get exercise. Now, she talks about potential toxins. Some examples would include fluoride in toothpaste, synthetic carpets, tap water, so she gets filtered or bottled water, particular cleaning agents. She recommends organic cleaning agents. There are also potential toxins in foam pillows and chemically treated clothes. And she talks quite a lot about the risk of mercury and recommends potentially removing mercury-containing amalgams using dental work. 
also in vaccines, and some of them can contain thimerosal, which does contain some mercury, though largely eliminated from modern vaccines used for younger children. She talks about other alternative treatments. I can't talk about all of them here, but she mentions Ayurveda, chiropractic manipulation, cannabis or marijuana. She has quite a long section on this. Antibiotics, as there's sort of an alternative theory that multiple sclerosis could be triggered by a, an indolent bacteria such as chlamydia. She talks about LDN or low dose naltrexone or estriol. There's some evidence based on a study in UCLA that estriol may be beneficial in MS. And she talks about many other alternative treatments in her book. Now, it's interesting that on Twitter, she originally did not want me to publish this video because she actually retracted some of the ideas that she talked about in the book. One thing she says is that she wasn't particularly compliant with the diet and she had kind of gone off and on the best bet diet over the years and she really regrets that wishing that she had been more consistent with the diet and she thinks that may have had something to do with her disease progression. She also has changed some of her ideas about saturated fat. You get the idea from the book that she may have been inspired by the writing of Terry Walls and that maybe she thinks saturated fat isn't all that bad. So she now uses coconut oil, ghee, and organ meat supplements, although she still avoids meat. So what she's doing now is sort of halfway between OMS and the Walls protocol. And she also acknowledges that there may be some benefit to disease modifying therapy, even though she herself didn't take them, and that the best option may be a combination of disease modifying therapies and a healthy lifestyle. And she also thinks that maybe she was taking too many supplements. She should have focused more on food and getting those nutrients from food rather than supplements. Anyways, I'm going to publish next week my personal review of the book, so please stay tuned and subscribe. And I'd like to ask the audience, have you read this book? And do you keep any of the principles of her ideas or the best bet diet?